All right. All right. I am live. Great. Shalom. All right. Now, let's get into the Torah reading. Put my phone down. And we shall get this. Nice day for like an hour because I have to go. Okay. That's fine. All right. I'll try to get through as much as possible. All right. So, <clears throat> lesson 41, the other side. Mark 4, Mark chapter 4, 35 through 5, uh, 20. Yeshua finishes with his sermon in the boat and informs his disciples that their next destination is the opposite shore of Lake Galilee, the other side, a term with dark spiritual connotations. The trip becomes even more ominous when a storm suddenly arises on the way. The disciples sense an imminent catastrophe descending on their small fishing vessel, find Yeshua asleep in the stern. He admonishes them for their lack of faith and stills the winds and waters with a few commanding words. <clears throat> when they reach the eastern shore of Lake Galilee, they find themselves in the region of Decapolis, which had been settled mostly by Gentiles. A man possessed by a demon comes to greet Yeshua. The demon knows that, that the Messiah is destined to sentence unclean spirits to an eternity of torment, but protests that the time has not yet come for this final judgment. <clears throat> Yeshua asks the demon its name. It's called Legion. There is a multitude of them in one man. Yeshua commands them to leave. They request to be sent into a herd of pigs. But while Yeshua uh, acquiesces uh, to their request, it does, it, it does them no good. The pigs immediately drown themselves in the lake. The foreman demoniac site sits at the feet of Yeshua, requesting to become a disciple. Yeshua, however, refuses. His mission is still narrowed in scope, limited to the children of Israel. When the locals see the destruction of a valuable herd of pigs, they ask Yeshua to leave. He returns to the boat and prepares to sail back to Capernaum. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, okay. Prayer. Okay. I hereby join myself to the Master Yeshua, the Messiah, the Righteous One, who is the bread of life and the true light, the source of eternal salvation for all those who hear him. Like a branch that remains in a vine, so may I remain in him, just as he also remains in the Father and the Father in him, in order that they may remain in us. May the grace of the Master Yeshua, the Messiah, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abound in us. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Across the lake. On that day when evening came, he said to them, let us go over to the other side. Mark 4.35. The crowds around Simon Peter's house in Capernaum had at times grown so thick that the master and the disciples did not have time to eat a meal. On one occasion, the crowd that followed him to the shore grew so large that in order to make his voice heard, the master sat in a fishing boat floating in the bay while the people lined the shore and the nearby slopes. After the sermon in the boat, Yeshua and the disciples returned to the home of Simon Peter, where the disciples asked him about his parables. Privacy was scarce, and people still waited outside for his attention. As the sun began to set with the onset of evening, the master proposed a plan to slip away from the crowd. He said, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, the disciples went down to the docks as if they intended to spend the night fishing. But they clandestinely took Yeshua along with them into the boat and set out across the lake. Mark's gospel recalls other boats were with him. 436. Perhaps additional boats of disciples, additional fishermen, or even eager pursuers from the crowds. They made for the Gentile territory on the eastern side of the lake, where Yeshua hoped they could find some solitude. However, entering get, um, Gentile territory meant crossing to the other side in a spiritual sense as well. Jewish spiritual terminology refers to the demonic forces of evil as the other side. <clears throat> Master of the Storm There arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat so much that the boat was already filling up, Mark 4.37. It was a dark and stormy night, for the Lord spoke and raised a stormy wind, which lifted the waves of the sea. They rose up to the heavens, they went down to the depths. Psalm 107.25-26 Sudden storms on Lake Galilee are common. 
high hills surround the lake. The cool winds from the height heights can easily clash with the warm air on the lake, displacing it and stirring the wind and waves into a violent tempest. The crest of the waves began to wash over the gunwales of the open, low-sided fishing boat. They began to be swamped and to be in danger. Luke 8.23 But as the boat pitched and rolled on the waves and filled with the water, the master slept soundly on a soggy cushion in the stern. As Mark described the storm, he makes several allusions to the story of Jonah. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid, but Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. Jonah chapter 1, 4 through 5. There arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Yeshua himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Mark chapter 4, verses 37 through 38. In both stories, the principal character sleeps peacefully while a deadly storm tosses the boat around. In both stories, the terrified sailors awaken the sleeper and rebuke him. In both stories, the principal character has the solution to the danger. Both storms are miraculously calmed. The miraculous calming of the sea terrifies both sets of sailors, even Mark's word choices. Echo the story of Jonah. The panicked disciples fought to keep the boat aright and afloat. Their soul melted away in misery. They reeled and staggered like a drunken man and were at their wit's end. They, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Psalm 107, 26 through 28. They shook the master awake, saying, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Mark chapter, thir- chapter 4, verse 38. As the boat plunged into the um, trough of a great wave, they cried out, Master, Master, we are perishing. Luke chapter 8, verse 24. He brought them out of their distress. He got up and rebuked the wind and the surging waves. He caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. Psalm 107, verse 29. The master rebuked the wind and the sea as if he was rebuking an evil spirit. Hush, be still. The same language accompanies the master's exorcisms. Rebuking a weather phenomenon makes no more sense than rebuking a fever. Yeshua addressed the hidden spiritual reality behind the revealed physical world. A fever is not just a fever. A storm is not just a storm. In Jewish cosmology, the spiritual world animates the physical world. The story suggests that spiritual forces were at work resisting the master's attempt to cross out of Jewish territory and enter their territory. At the master's rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of his voice, they hurried back. Thus he rebuked the sea. He rebuked the sea and made it quiet. Psalm 104, verse 7, Psalm 106, verse 9, Nahum, chapter 1, verse 4. As the waves flattened out into quiet ripples, the master turned to the disciples and asked, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Mark chapter 4, verse 40. The disciples did have faith, but the rabbi from Galilee significantly stretched it. In the Jonah story, the calming of the sea strikes fear into the hearts of the sailors. The men feared the Lord greatly. In the gospel story, the disciples have a similar reaction to the calming of the sea. They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Mark 4, 41. The region of the great um, uh, Gerasenes. There came to, they came to the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gerasenes. Mark chapter 5, verse 1. The storm had passed, but the sun had not yet risen. They continued to cross the lake and landed on the eastern shore. The precise location is uncertain and the various manuscript traditions behind the Synoptic Gospels offer all sorts of competing names for it. Most manuscripts of Mark read region of the Gerasenes, which refer to the Decapolis city of Gerasa, modern Jerish. But Jerish sits more than 30 miles from the lake. The northern half of the eastern shore would have been more accurately described as the region of Sisitanes. Since the Decapolis city of Hippus, Hebrew Susita, sat in a prominent hill overlooking the shore. Perhaps region of the Gerasenes was a way of speaking broadly about the Decapolis territory. 
Matthew chapter 8, 28, alternatively, calls it the country of the Gadarenes, Gadara, meaning um, uh, modern Umkais, another de Decapolis city sits five miles to the south east of the lake across the large Yarmuk Canyon and may have controlled territory reaching to the lake, but hardly as far north as the gospel story requires. Several textual variants add to the confusion. Some manuscripts of Matthew have uh, Gergesenes, one manuscripts Gazarenes, and some agree with Mark and read Gerasenes. Mark chapter 5 verse 1 and Luke 8 26 both agree on Gerasenes, but textual variants or both passages offer Gergesenes and Gergesenes. Some of the variants are based upon Origen's emendation to the text. In the third century, Origen's commentary on John apparently changed the reading in Matthew from Gadarenes to Gergesenes. Pope posing a town named Gergasa, which he identified with the site of Kersi. Cur which, whatever the case may have been, the details of the story limited to the eastern shore of Lake Galilee. Luke tells us they sailed to the country of the Ger Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee, opposite Magdala on the east shore of the lake, just a few miles north of the, of the Decapolis city of Hippus. The Gentile city of Kersi sat on the bank of a canyon that descends from the Golan Heights. Ah, uh, the Golan Heights, those are nice. I've been there. Uh, Road, oh my God, the road was scary to go down. <clears throat> Very scary. You can see cars at the bottom crashed like, and just burned from the explosion that they suffered. Um, you also would see, um, we came across IDF looking over into Jordan from the Golan Heights to uh, make sure they weren't trying to do anything bad. <clears throat> um, positing a town named Gergesa, which he had done, uh, uh, what was that? Um, Where's the goal? There it is. The Talmud lists Kersi as one of the five appointed temples of idolatry, meaning that it was one of the only five places in the world within which the sages prohibited Jews from transacting business with Gentiles. I went there in 2009 with uh, my Bible school that I was attending at the time. It was a third year trip and we went for three weeks. Uh, went as far south as Masada. Uh, no, as, and or no, is Masada... Which one's further south, En Gedi or Masada? I think it's Masada further south than En Gedi, or it might be En Gedi. I can't remember which. But I went as far north as Tel Dan, uh, where we could get a great view of um, uh, Mount Hermon, and there's still like an old Babylonian high place up there. This is really interesting, really beautiful, beautiful country. Um, in 1970, an Israeli road crew accidentally uncovered the walls of a monastery on the east shore of the Lake Galilee. A subsequent excavation restored the ruins of a Byzantine-era church and monastery that Christians had built to remember the miracle at Kersi. For more on the location of the incident, see JMR Geography page on Club Hub. The actual incident could have taken place anywhere within the vicinity. Regardless of the exact location, this story clearly occurred in territory presided over by the Gentile cities of the Capitalists. The presence of swine herders ruled out the possibility that the characters in the story were Jewish. Swine must not be raised by Jews at any place. Mishnah. I love getting to Mishnah. So pretty much Jews are not allowed to raise swine. Did not know that. Okay. Um... <clears throat> The demoniac, when he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. Mark chapter 5, verse 2. No sooner did the master step from the boat onto the shore that a demoniac, demonized man, came shrieking down from the tombs cut into the hills above. The Gospels briefly describe the man, an unclean man, living in an unclean place, possessed by unclean spirits. He lived in the tombs. As Mark and Luke tell the story of Legion, only one demoniac is involved. But Matthew 8.28 says two men who were demon-possessed met him as they were coming out of the tombs. This is one instance of several doub doublings in Matthew, uh, such as Matthew 9.27 and Matthew 20.30. Perhaps there were two men uh, involved, but Mark focuses only on the more dramatic story. The, 
the demoniac exhibited a supernatural strength such that no one was able to bind him anymore. At Mark chapter 5, verse 3. For he broke the chains and shackles apart. He had not put on any clothing for a long time. Luke 8, 27. His body always had open wounds because he continuously gashed at his own flesh with stones. He spent his waking hours shrieking and screaming in the tombs and on the hills. Like some type of demoniac sentinels, he and another demoniac were so extremely violent that no one could pass by that way. Matthew 8, 28. Mark's description seems to follow a loose uh, chiastic structure, uh, a chiasm in a structural device and poetic ornament frequently employed in Hebrew poetry to create mirror image symmetry in a text. Uh, Hasidic structure behind the text of Mark chapter 5, 2 through 6. Immediately a man from the tomb with an unclean spirit met him. A. B. He had a um, he had his dwelling among the tombs. C. And no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. D. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And another D. And the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. C. And no one was strong enough to subdue him. B. Constantly, day and night, he was screaming among the tombs. A. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. <clears throat> the Talmud describes a psychological disorder with some similar symptoms. Our rabbis taught, who is a lunatic? Someone who goes out at night by himself and spends the night in a, in a cemetery and tears his garments? If he spent the night in a cemetery, I could say he did it so that an unclean spirit would come upon him. If he went out alone at night, I could say he was seized by lycanthropy. If he tears his garments, I could say he was in a trance. If he does all three, he has all the symptoms of a lunatic. Talmud. <clears throat> Do not torment me. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other? Jesus, son of the most high God, I implore you, by God, do not torment me. Mark 5, chapter 6 through, Mark chapter 5, verses 6 through 7. <clears throat> From his high perch in the darkness of the caves and tombs cut into the hillside, the demoniac looked down on the lake below him and across the water into the land of the Jews like a sentinel guarded in his domain. That night, just before dawn, he spied a fishing boat gliding through the dark water, sliding up onto the lake shore below. The spirits within him sprang into a panic and sent him leaping forth from the tombs, pouncing down the hillside, screaming as he went, What business do we have with each other, Yeshua, son of the Most High God? The first title, Yeshua, refers to the master's physical person. The second, son of the Most High God, refers to his spiritual identity. Like the spirit in Capernaum synagogue, the evil spirit asked rhetorically, What business do we have with each other? Mark 1, 24 and Luke 4.34. The question is a, bi is a biblical Hebrew idiom for what do you have against me? The tormented man cast himself down before Yeshua's feet. In the typical exorcism encounter, the exorcist commands an evil spirit. On the authority of a higher power, exorcism formulas often invoked the name of God. The first century Jewish historian Josephus reported seeing an exorcist who used the name of King Solomon Antiquities. This is from um, Josephus Antiquities. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, the disciples cast out demons in the name of Yeshua. In this instance, however, the formula is reversed. Rather than the exorcist adjuring the demon by the authority of God's name, the evil spirit adjures the exorcist in God's name. I implore you by God, do not torment me. With the reversal of formula, the demons attempted to turn the tables on the exorcist and preempt the ordinary formula by first identifying Yeshua by name and then adjuring him in the name of God, the attempt fails. He has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Revelation 19.12 what, what sorts of torture might the spirit have feared? Matthew's version of the story provides a critical clue when the demon asks, Have you come here to torment us before the time? Matthew 8.29, emphasis added. 
Several works of the Apocrypha and Jewish Apocalypse anticipate a coming eschatological judgment on the devil and his chaotic minions of evil spirits. The demons enjoy an era of havoc between the flood and the final judgment, during which God allows them to operate with impunity. At the conclusion of that time, however, they will face the punishment. The master spoke of an eternal fire, which has been prepared for by the devil and his angels. <clears throat> Matthew twenty-five forty-one. According to the book of First Enoch, the son of man will judge the falling angels. In those days, they shall be led off to the abyss of fire and to the torment and to the prison in which they shall be confined forever. First Enoch. You mighty kings who dwell on the earth, you who behold my chosen one, how he sits on the throne of glory and judges Azazel and all his associates and all his hosts in the name of the Lord of spirits. First Enoch. The evil spirits anticipated an appointed time of torment, but they were surprised to see the son of man, the son of the most high, the agent of their torment so long in advance of the appropriated, oh, excuse me, of the appointed time. They felt that they felt their lease on earth was not yet up and that his early arrival was in bad taste. They seemed to possess some sense of the passage of time and a fairly clear notion that Yeshua had arrived in advance of the scheduled day for judgment. Neither Matthew nor the community of early Jewish believers for whom he wrote could have appreciated the de demons' surprise as much as the modern reader. The apostolic era believers anticipated the coming of the Son of Man within their generation. After all, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. From their perspective, the demon might have been dismayed to see the Messiah some 40 years before the anticipated appointed time. From our perspective, we realize that the demons were hoping for another 2,000 years or so before they had to relinquish their claims to go into torment. In the story of Legion, the demons not only recognize Yeshua and identify him as the Son of God, but they also acknowledge that he is the one destined to judge them and dispose of them. <clears throat> the demons know that the one day, that one day the Messiah will send them into the fire. Satan said before the Holy One, Blessed be he, master of the world, the light which is hidden under your throne of glory, for whom is destined, for whom it destined. He said to him, For him who will turn you back and disgrace you, and shame your face. He said to him, Master of the world, show him to me. He said to him, Come and see him. When Satan saw the Messiah, he trembled and fell upon his face and said, Surely this is the Messiah who is who in the future will cast me and all the princes of the nations of the world in Gehenna. Uh, Pesikta Rabati. <coughs> Not sure what that is. <coughs> um, the, this epic story of the ensuing exorcism into the swine herd has prophetic significance. Not only does it allude to Pharaoh and his armies drowning in the Sea of Reeds, this story also offers a prophetic preview of the of the coming kingdom when the adversary and his minions will be cast down and ultimately extinguished in the lake of fire. He was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Mark chapter 5, 9 through 10. Yeshua met with surprising re, um, resisted, resistance. In all other exorcism encounters, he simply spoke a word or two, and the spirits fled with shrieks from before him. In this instance, we read that he had been saying to him, Come out of that man, you unclean spirit. Mark chapter 5, verse 8. And yet the spirit kept on blathering. The master demanded the spirit's name in order to exercise it more effectively. The demons replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. Mark 5, 9. Who is Legion? What are the legions? The legions are the might and the power and the strength of Rome. The evil spirit identifies itself more or less as Rome. My name is Legion, for we are many. Can be interpreted to mean we are the power of Rome. The answer may be hyperbole. Evil spirits are not known for their honesty, or it may not. The size of a Roman legion varied um, from between 4,000 to 6,000 men. <coughs> Yeshua was not confronted by only one demon, 
as he stepped onto Gentile territory by an army of them. The spirits begged him not to send them out of the region, with, um, which suggested um, such spirits are territorial. Likewise, the Romans were territorial. They did not want their occupation of the land to end. The demons feared lest Yeshua send them to waterless places, far from human ha habitations, where they could find no rest. They feared he might send them prematurely into the place of their punishment. Uh, Matthew 12, 43 and Luke eleven twenty four. 24. I forget to say that. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Luke 8, 31. They begged him to at least allow them to enter the bodies of a nearby herd of swine, some 2,000 animals, which suggests that such beers seek out corporeal experience and that it is, a, it is precious to them. They said, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine so that we may enter, enter them. Matthew 8, 31 and Mark 5, 12. Surprisingly, the master, I'm not sure what that word is, but allowed um, heard to their entreaties, perhaps to facilitate a quick and easy exorcism, he gave them permission. <clears throat> um, Jesus gave the per um, them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered a swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea. The plan went awry for, for the demons. The swine upon which they descended went into a panic and charged down the slope of the hills. The disciples witnessed a horrible cacophony of screaming animals and thundering hooves as the enormous stampede crashed headlong downhill, like some sort of apocalyptic nightmare. The pigs charged across the shore and threw themselves into the lake, ro roiling up the waters and drowning themselves amidst a horrible racket of churning water and terrified squealing. The entire thing went on for several minutes. By the time the noise had died and the last pig had drowned itself in the lake, as many as 6,000 unclean spirits found themselves moping about dejectedly without hosts. What an impression it must have made upon the bewildered disciples. They must have felt that they had some epic prophetic vision brought to life before their eyes. The story of the unclean man who dwelt in an unclean place possessed by unclean spirits, which entered unclean animals, has some obvious symbolic value appropriate for an apocalypse. <clears throat> this story is more than just a story. The legion occupying the demonized man symbolized the Roman occupation of the land. The Roman legions carried the image of the wild boar upon their standards. I didn't know that. The expulsion of the demons and the destruction of the um, swine herd hints towards the toppling of Rome and liber li liberation of Israel. It indicated that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Jewish, Jewish expectation anticipated that Messiah would drive the Romans out of the land as certainly as Yeshua had driven legion out of the de demoniac. The de demoniac Gentile man himself did not drown in the sea with the swine. Instead, Yeshua cleansed him of the spirits that occupied him. The people of the Decapolis arrived and found him dressed, bandaged, in his right mind, sitting at the feet of Yeshua. He asked permission to follow Yeshua to return with them to Galilee and become a disciple. This story hints toward Messiah's ultimate victory over Roman and nations. His ultimate victory is not the destruction of nations, but the redemption of the nations. He will liberate all peoples from the power of Satan, as it says. Satan will be thrown into the abyss, which will be shut and sealed over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer. Revelation 20, verse 3. Yeshua is the final victor, and the greatest token of his victory, the clearest evidence that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is not the destruction of Rome's legions, but their conversion from the darkness of idolatry and the worship of Satan to faith in God of Israel and his son Yeshua. In this way, Yeshua is the victor even now, while he await the kingdom, we already see the kingdom at hand as the gospel of this good news of the kingdom advances through history and across the globe, topples empires, destroys strongholds, possesses kingdoms, and turns all men to the God of Israel. <clears throat> all right. They came to Jesus and observed the man who had been demon-possessed sitting down, clothed in uh, his right mind, the very man who had the legion 
and they became frightened. Those who had seen it described to them how it had happened to the demon-possessed man and all about the swine. And they began to implore him to leave their region. Mark chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. The swine herders came running down the hillside only to find the carcass, carcasses of their herd washing up on the shore. They hurried back to the city and reported everything, including what had happened to the demoniac. They reported it to the city and out in the country. Luke 8.34 The locals came to see what had happened. Behold, the whole city came to, out to meet Yeshua. Matthew 8.34 And no doubt to salvage what they could of the pigs. They came to Yeshua and observed the man who had been demon-possessed, sitting down clothed and in his right mind, the very man who had a legion, and they became frightened. Mark 5.15 the swine herders recounted the entire story again and again as more and more people came down to the lakeside. The people of the region were not enthusiastic about Yeshua's hand handiwork. They began to implore him to leave their region. The request is eerily similar to that of Legion, who implored Yeshua not to send them out of the region. One might expect the people of the region to bring out their sick and their infirm, as the people of, in Capernaum had done after Yeshua exercised the man in their synagogue. Not so. The loss of an enormous herd of swine, apparently a local industry, had not made a good impression upon the Gentiles of the region. Apparently, the cost was too high. <clears throat> he did not let him, but he said to him, Come home to your people. Report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Mark 5.19 The locals begged the master to leave their territory. The disciples concurred the quiet respite they had coming, come seeking eluded them. After the dramatic storm at sea and the dramatic encounter with a legion of demons, the disciples were more than ready to get back into the boat and head for the safety of home. As they were getting into the boat, however, the liber liberated man begged Yeshua to take him along. The former demoniac was sitting down at the, the feet of Yeshua. And Luke 8.35, an idiom for discipleship. He wanted to become a disciple. As the master stepped back into the boat, the healed demoniac followed after him, wading into the water, begging him, take me with you. He implored him that he might be with him, echoing the phrase used to describe the special role of the twelve in Mark 3.14. The master did not allow it. He was not ready to start taking Gentile disciples. The son of man was sent only to the law sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15.24. Instead, Yeshua instructed the man to go and tell his people what great things the Lord has done for you and how he ha had mercy on you. Mark 5, 19. Ordinarily, when the master performed a healing, he told a recipient to keep the matter quiet. See that you tell no one, he said. He always said. This time, he told the man to publicize the entire matter to his family, his relatives, and his people. It's the only occasion he tells someone to spread the story of one of his miracles. What makes this particular healing different? In all the other stories, Yeshua is in Jewish territory working among the Jewish people. Oh, me. In this instance, he is in Gentile territory speaking to a Gentile. Why did Yeshua avoid publicity when among the Jewish people, but actually encourage it among the Gentiles across the lake? The Master had several reasons for keeping his miracles and his identity quiet while in Jewish territory. In Jewish territory, he worked in secrecy to avoid the word-of-mouth reports that attracted the multitudes. The people coming to him already exceeded his capacity. Already the crowds had grown to such an extent that Yeshua could no longer publicly enter a city, but stayed out in an unpopulated areas, and they were coming to him from everywhere. Mark 1.45 He and the disciples had crossed the lake into Gentile territory that night, specifically to escape those crowds. In Gentile territory, however, he had no concerns about unmanageable crowds. The Gerasene and the Gadarene Gentiles <clears throat> lived far from the center of his ministry in Gal Galilee, and they were not likely to cross into Jewish territory to seek out a Jewish healer. In Jewish territory, he tried to keep his ministry and his work quiet so that he did not become the lightning rod of zealot mess messianism. In Gentile territory, he did not need to worry about people's preconceived messianic expectations. He had no concerns about sparking an open revolution among the Gadarenes or the Gerasenes. In Jewish territory, he had to worry about the crowds attracting the attention of Herod Antipas. 
His rising popular appeal might lead to his arrest as he happened, as had happened with John the Immerser. He had no such fear among the Decapolis Gentiles. Therefore, he encouraged a man to go and spread the good news about what the God of the Jews had done for him. Lord or Lord. <clears throat> he went away and began to proclaim to Deca in Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him, and everyone was amazed. Mark 5.20 Yeshua instructed the man to go and tell his people what great things the Lord, uh, Kurios, has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Mark 5.19 Like the Hebrew Adon, the Greek title Kurios simply means Master or Lord. People used it politely as a title of respect, like the English titles Mr. and Sir. At the same time, Greek-speaking Jews used it as a standard circumlocution for the ineffable name of God. In the days of the Master, the Jewish people had ceased using the unique name of God for fear of breaking the third commandment. Instead of pronouncing God's name, they employed circumlocutions, circumlocutions, I think I'm saying that right, these evasive synonyms at well understood as equivalents for the name of God are still employed today, such as Hashem, which literally means the name. Similarly, our English translations of the Bible use a common circumlocution by translating the sacred name of God as Lord. Yeshua himself used evasive sentiments to speak of God. He referred to him as the Father, my Father, the Spirit, the Mighty One, and Heaven. Jewish Greek commonly used the title Kyrios, Lord, as a substitute for God's Hebrew name. This is what Yeshua meant when he told him that the man to go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord Hashem has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Mark 5, 19. Uh, the eagle is um, the Roman standards. Ah, so it's not the boar. Where did they get the boar from? I wonder, uh, I wonder if they uh, used the uh, different platoons. And they had different emblems. Possible. <laughs> Instead, the man went away. Maybe uh, Google bore on a shield. I don't want to look that up. Uh, Instead, the man went away and began to proclaim in Decapolis what great things Yeshua had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Mark 5.20. In the Gospels, the disciples often referred to Yeshua as Kurios, but they did not refer to him as Hashem. Even when the Gospels do make that implication in the mystery of the Incarnation, it would be an anachronistic to project those implications back onto the early narratives of Yeshua's encounters with common people and even with his disciples at that stage. At that stage, the disciples still pose the question, who is this man? <coughs> the boar? eagle was right they referred to him as curios master because he was their teacher and their teacher disciple relationship of first century judaism expressed itself in terms of a servant to a master but they were not referring to him by god's name in the story, Yeshua told the liberated man to go out and tell everyone what the Lord had done for him. He intended the man to spread the fame of God, of, of the God of Israel among the Gentile idolaters with whom he lived. Instead, the man went and told everyone what great things Yeshua had done for him. Playing with the ambiguity of the title Curios, Mark invites his readers to consider the relationship, the relationship between Curios, the master, <coughs> And Curios Hashem, Luke's version of the story, makes the tension between the titles explicit. Return to your house and describe the, what great things God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Yeshua had done for him. Luke 8.39. He probably, being a Gentile, he, 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 thought that he, meant, he thought that he was God. Like, come on. That doesn't make Yeshua God. That just means that the Gentile, being a pagan and who he is... A man just brought demons out of him, didn't really understand, and so he figured it was he was God himself. Who healed the man? Whose power drove God's power? Who I mean we 
none of our own powers, not our own powers, by the power of God. Um, who healed the man? Whose power drove out a whole legion of demons? Was it a Hashem? Yes. Or was it Yeshua? It was both. God's power through Yeshua. Surely this could only be the hand of Hashem. Yep. God settles the solitary in a house, leading forth prisoners mightily. Also those that act pro provokingly, even those who dwell in tombs. Psalm 68, 6. But then one must ask, who is this man who yields the power of Hashem? He was Hashem's son. <clears throat> and that's the end of that. That's the end. My voice is raspy, man. <clears throat> oh. Any questions? Jesus is God. In a sense, yes, I agree. Agency. He was an agent of God. He was a shaliach, the apostle of God, as Paul says. And just as the apostles were the apostles of Yeshua, if, you, if they, re, uh, they receive you, they receive me, and they receive the one who sent me. If they reject you, then they reject me, and then they reject the one who sent me. <clears throat> it's, all, it's all agency. The Father is greater than I. I did not come to do my, my will, but the will of the one who sent me. Yep. He is God's son. The word of God. But tell me something. <clears throat> is the word of God God? Um, do, you wor do you worship a Torah scroll? Do you worship the Bible? Is the Bible God? Yeah, God, God, God's son. Right, but, the, but God's son is not. Uh, I, um, I don't think he was a mi minor rabbi at all. Because um, there was uh, a story um, in one of the Gospels, I believe Luke, um, <clears throat> when a uh, uh, elder uh, from the synagogue came and fell at the, his feet. And says, my daughter is dying. Can you please heal her? Um, uh, and so he was recognizing uh, Yeshua as a greater rabbi. And then what, another person came to him and says, do not bother the teacher no more. Do not bother the rabbi no more. Your daughter is already dead. So he was. Um, he would have been a, a, a major rabbi, a uh, great rabbi. Uh, my now, Brad, alternate media. Brad has a uh, video on John one one, but you can also look up Biblical Unitarian dot uh, dot org or dot com, and uh, they have common verses, and that's one of those common verses. See what that alludes to is: um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Right. So better sheet in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. Okay. Better sheet. Bet Rashi. Uh Rashi's commentary. Um with Rashis, God creating the heaven and the earth. What is Rashis? Well, Rashis has been referred to as the Jewish people or as the Torah. So um, the Torah, with, with the Jewish people, God created the heavens and the earth? No. With the Torah, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. With the Torah, God created the heavens and the earth. So, and this also goes back with to uh, the world was created through him. Yep. The word was uh, made flesh and dwelt among us. You're right. Uh, it did, but do you worship a Torah scroll? <clears throat> I don't worship a Torah scroll. He's, uh, he's the, uh, uh, written and the oral Torah all in one, but he's not Hashem. Hashem is an all-consuming fire. If an all-consuming fire came down, all this would be gone in an instant. 
to put. So he's he's not the he, he's not the fullness of God. I mean, technically, we all have the fullness of God in us. Even uh, as Ephesians, I believe, chapter two says, uh, we have the fullness of God in us, just like he had the fullness of God in him. So, um, <clears throat> but he, so it, when Tertullian um, made the Trinity, he recognized that there is a um, a Trinity. So there is a continuity problem there, see, because no man has seen God. Now, Moses uh, says that Moses spoke to God face to face. But again, no one has seen God's face. So is, is there a contradiction, therefore, in the Bible? No, it's just idioms. That's just it, um, he, the Hebrew idioms. That's all it is. Uh, there's agency. So pretty much. Jesus is the God as Joseph was the Pharaoh. When uh, Joseph was um, was made um, regent, he had all the power and authority of Pharaoh. It, the only thing that he didn't have was the title Pharaoh. And the only thing that Pharaoh ever worried about was what he would eat and drink. He didn't worry about anything else in the land because everything else in the land, Joseph took care of. But he was still Pharaoh. Joseph wasn't Pharaoh. And then you, um, and then you see that uh, Moses was another agent of God. He says, "I make you God to Pharaoh." So that's what it is. The Torah is the Word. That's why you're so knowledgeable and so wise. Huh? It's all symbology. He was given the complete knowledge of the Torah. He was given complete knowledge of the Torah. Yes, 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 I see you. Like, look into uh, agency. Um, I have a hard time finding a website myself, but ask ask alternate media Brad and alternate media Seamus, random Chris. Um, they they can explain agency so well, especially alternate media Brad. Very very uh, uh, intelligent guy. So is Seamus. Um, Seamus is more free now because he hurt his hand um, while away. Well, then then talk to Seamus. Seamus is a good guy. Like. <clears throat> No one cannot like Seamus because he he has a certain way about him. So he's uh, more uh, he has a more loving approach. Seamus does. He's uh, uh, he's just a better at it, and he he can explain agency if you ask him. Um, so yeah, um, but uh, G, G, when when they they will not say Jesus is God, but they see Jesus as God because of agency. Uh, so, but Tertullian, <clears throat> Tertullian, when he made, uh, when he coined the term Trinity, he recognized that Jesus was subservient to the Father. Um, he only um, uh, saw the Trinity because there is a uh, uh, hierarchy with God the Father at the top. He is the Almighty Creator, but then all power and authority was. Given um, on earth and in heaven was given unto um, Jesus, but God is still God, but He doesn't have to worry about um, doing anything. Just like Pharaoh didn't have to worry about doing anything, except for what he was going to eat. So, but Joseph again wasn't Pharaoh, and Jesus again isn't God. This has all the power and authority. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it took like I was a Trinitarian for a long, like my whole life, like my whole life I was a Trinitarian, like until like last month. Um, then the scales were, were removed from my eyes. I cannot consider myself a Messianic Jew um, because I was not born Jewish, and I have not gone through the conversion process. I will consider myself a mess Messianic Gentile, um, but um, uh, not not Jewish. 
I would go through the conversion process in a heartbeat if it meant um, uh, I didn't have to give up my Messiah, but I'd have to renounce my Messiah, and I'm not going to do that. He who denies me before men, will, I will deny before my father. I'm, I'm not about to do that. I, I, I need a good lawyer when I go before the judgment seat. Um, and uh, because, like, you know, like, without, without that good lawyer, I'm doomed. So, yeah, um, not renouncing my Messiah. <laughs> I need all that grace. I need all that grace. Oh, boy, do I need that grace. Uh, but he is he is working on me. He is changing me, teaching me new things. Uh, I get, we were in good conversation yesterday. Nice long conversation yesterday. Wow, that was a good conversation yesterday. <clears throat> Pretty much clear clear thought. What he put through was do better. And so I like, yep, yeah, okay, do better. Start start my own personal life because my house is a mess. Um, I need to treat people in my personal life better uh, and people here on TikTok better. Um, so I got to work on myself. But I'm starting small with cleaning, cleaning house and uh, trying to get out of being the lazy self. So... He also wants the whole world to do better and be the change. We're, uh, he wants us to live in a way like he is already here and like he is among us. He wants us to live in a way to where he is among us all the time. And we've been failing to do that, myself especially. I know that I'm supposed to do that, but I forget that to do that. Um. Uh, but, um, yeah, uh, I forget to uh, acknowledge his presence all the time, even though he is with us all the time. And so we should be respectful of his presence all the time. Now, the Orthodox Jews and how they wear the hats and uh, their garments and everything else like that, um, they are practicing the presence of God all the time. Like, that's, that's what they do. Who's the one dude? <clears throat> shoe, shoe. I've never heard of him. Um, shoe is is it, now. Isn't he from Kung Fu Panda? <laughs> oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. We, we've had interesting discussions, even though we don't always see eye to eye, for sure. You should have your husband get a TikTok account. I, I, um, what is he? Is he, like, is he Pentecostal still, or what is he? <clears throat> um, I had a problem. Stop midday, and now I'm going to speak. Pray my breathing stops. Okay, Hashem, take care of my father. You got that. When the breathing stops. Good, good, no. Reply to my comment, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He's Pentecostal still, but doesn't go to church. A Pentecostal that doesn't go to church? Is it because he would, was only interested in going with you or something? That puppy is a misbehavior. Oh. He ain't been to church except when I begged him in the last six years. Oh. Yeah. I, I feel like we all go through our times. Like, there was a time um, I wasn't going to church for a long time. Um, like, let's see here. Um, I graduated Bible school. Um. Moved out to Michigan, found myself a Baptist church out there, and attended that um, practically every Sunday. Then I moved out with, to, with him to my dad's place in New York. Didn't go to church at that time, um, but then I went to I was I started attending college uh, to become a pastor, 
and um, I found a good little Baptist church. Um, and I enjoyed the pastor. I even um, like the Holy Spirit blessed me during the service one of the times. But um, before the service started, everyone was, was around me talking. Music was playing. And then the Holy Spirit just comes down, um, recognizes that I'm sitting there in the presence of the Lord, quiet, as it says in Habakkuk to do. Um, the Lord is in the sanctuaries. Be quiet before him. Um, and uh, he blessed me. Um, and I looked to see if anyone else could feel it. See, feel it. No one else could feel it. Um, so, oh, Shabbat Shalom, coming into truth. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, it was a, um, no one else could feel it. But then, but then some worldly Christian music started playing. Like it was Christian music. The lyrics were Christian, but the but the music itself wasn't. It was worldly. So, and then like the Holy Spirit like immediately left. <laughs> and then I moved um, into Massachusetts to help my mom. And I started attending her church. Didn't like it very much. It was congregational. I mean, it was a good church, but the pews were uncomfortable. Like, um, I, um, I, I don't, I'm not a big fan of pews. Um, so I stopped going, got into uh, drugs, depression, whatnot. Yes, hi. Yes, hi, hi. Yes, hi. Yeah. Yes, hi. Uh, and then last year, uh, 2020, uh, June, I was whatnot, uh, Lord started speaking to me and rededicated my life. I mean, I've always been a Christian, but rededicated and uh, um, uh, started uh, really attending church again every week. Um, but recently, I haven't been going really every week. I've been going once a month to get Lord's Supper. Um, but I've been, uh, I got a truck, and that truck is like expensive on gas. Like it costs 80 bucks to fill it up all the way. Um, and I, I do a lot of traveling, and I see my aunt on Saturdays usually uh, once in a while. But now I've got my tour club on Saturday. So there's going to be some Saturdays when I go to see my aunt, some Saturdays when I go to tour club. Um, my aunt is 98 years old. Um, so yeah. And so, but I'll, I'll go, I go to church once in a while, but, um, I would go to synagogue if there was one close to me, but my rabbi's Torah club is, uh, uh it's good enough. I enjoy it. <coughs> Kneelers. 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 Kneelers? What are you talking? Kneelers? What are those? What are kneelers? You're eating now. You've had all day to eat. Really girl. I've never heard of kneelers. Those they're uncomfortable though, I guess. I don't know. Do they like go on your knees or something? Yeah. Oh. Can't wait! I cannot wait. Like uh, you guys have any idea? Like it's been around this time of year that God always talks to me. Um, it's always like right before September. Like August is always a big heavy month, like for some reason. And then I realized, well, next month is Rosh Hashanah. Or next month is the Jewish New Year. This is actually the end of the year when we're supposed to get rid of all of our bad um, ilk and whatnot. Realize what we have done wrong this whole past year, ask for forgiveness for it, and then go into the new year trying to be changed. And the new year is actually next month, Rosh Hashanah. I can't wait to celebrate with my uh, um, rabbi at his uh, synagogue and blow, blow the uh, shofar, as we all will blow the shofar in the synagogue. And I can bet you anything, it will get loud. Well, it's way over in Clinton, Massachusetts, and I'm over in Orange, Massachusetts. Yes, yes. Can you like, be careful? I don't want you to ruin this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Bundle of energy. This one. Husky and German Shepherd Coonhelm. Like bundle of energy. Everyone was warning me it was going. She was going to be. All right. The bottom of the back and the pew, literally to kneel. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I've never seen kneelers. 
uh, are those only like Catholic or something? My my oh my church in New Hampshire, um, they they uh, have theater like old fashioned theater seatings, like they're like these uh, old fashioned chairs, <coughs> um, but they're fold those fold down chairs, so they have a nice cushion back, um, but. Uh, I think they came from like a theater that like was shut down in like the eighties or so. So they're they're old, but they're comfortable. Ah, uh, yeah, see, that's that's why I have no clue what they are. Uh, I actually, uh, I think I've been in a Catholic church once when I was a very little boy, and my dad was going there for some strange reason. So I don't know. 20 minutes is nothing. Nothing. Um, my church, when I was going to Bible school at my church, we we do the three Jewish feasts. I am, I, I mean, I'm, I'm fat. I'm not super fat, but I'm fat. Uh, but, but we do the three Jewish feasts, uh, the uh, Tabernacles, Passover, and Pentecost. And there's usually an open-ended prayer meeting for one day during one of those feasts. And it usually starts in the afternoon and lasts until dinner time. So it can it, um, it depends, though. Sometimes they cut it short, sometimes they don't. But you're usually looking at um, up and down on your knees. And sometimes you're on your knees for a good half hour to 45 minutes at a time, sometimes more, depending on how many people continue the, the prayer until they say amen and rise. So you, you can usually be on your knees for anywhere from uh, uh, 10 minutes to an uh, hour or so, depending on how many people are there, how many people pray um, and uh, whatnot. So it's, 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 it's something. Coming into truth, you're old. I'm 34, my knees were never really something powerful. So I have. Ever since I dislocated one, they they haven't been the same. Like I slipped on ice, and um, I tried um, going one way and another way at the same time. I guess, and um, well, my knee popped out of its joint and was on the side. Like I thought I broke my I, like, I thought I broke my leg for a second, um, but then it. Um, popped back in, um, and it's just by itself. It's never been the same. Um, I get aches once in a while, but nothing major. Uh, so, yeah, that was interesting. I was born with scoliosis. <laughs> we all have our issues. Uh, 47, you are old, man. <laughs> Uh, I remember those Baptist altar prayers. Altar prayers in a Baptist. Oh yeah, we yeah they do. Uh, we'll go up to the altar um, once in a while. Not very often, but they they, they happen once in a while. <clears throat> do they? Um, now I, I remember a lot of candlelight services on um, uh, around Christmas time. That was always interesting. Candlelight services were worse worse something. Uh pagans, pagans, pagans. All those pagans. <laughs> Pagan practices. So silly. Yep. <laughs> yep. I I I flat out asked my pastor, like, because they celebrate Passover, and then like uh a few weeks after Passover. They're having an Easter service. I says, why are, why are you having an Easter service? We just did Passover. Make no sense. <laughs> and he says, well, we've been, uh, we, 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 uh, we uh, don't celebrate it in the pagan way. Like, you're having egg salad and um, other kind of egg um, meals, like deviled eggs and whatnot, for a potluck afterwards. So you're using eggs uh, purposely during the potluck recognizing the whole like come on but it's whatever their hearts in the right place at least 
That's just that their mind's not in the right place. <laughs> oh, I just can't. I just can't wait until the Messiah comes and sets everything right. Oh, it's going to be an interesting. <clears throat> like I was reading Revelation, and the whole world, the whole world is going to go to war with him. Like all the nations, kings, and like all the armies and whatnot, they're going to go to war with the Messiah. So it's going to look like some sort of invasion that they're fighting against. And they're going to be like, it's going to look like a very oh, trick against uh, the people. And uh, it says that and also in Revelation that his followers will go to war with him. That means us. So we're fighting on the ground and he's coming down, fighting, coming down and rescuing us. And we're still fighting alongside him. Like it's going to be one heck of a massacre. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're going Ooh, that's going to be a one. What? That's going to be one glorious day of battle. Uh, I wonder how long that battle will last, though. That that'll be interesting. That'll be that'll be interesting for sure. I know, right? I hope my Torah club will do a study on Revelation because that'll be fun. But I got a lot of reading material, like a lot of reading material. Um, my uh, rabbi told me to uh, get. God's appointed customs and God's appointed times to be able to understand the uh, uh, different Jewish holidays. And so I was looking up those on Amazon and I found a messianic um, commentary on Revelation. Oh my gosh, I picked up the Revelation one. But it also had Philippians and um, John and other ones. And I have uh, a old one and then I have Galatians, Every Man's Talmud, the Holy Days. I I got so many reading material, so much reading material to do. It's it's gonna take me a while. Right now I have been reading where is it? I have been reading Rethinking the Five Sola, which has been which has been really good. Uh it's pretty much tears apart solified and uh sola scriptura tears tears it apart like something else. Uh, and then it talks about Sola Gratia, Sola uh, Christus, um, and something else. Um, I'm almost done with it. Almost done with it. And then Random Chris um, pointed me to um, a uh, website, Hebrew for Christians. So I've been learning some little bit of Hebrew. I got some Hebrew um, uh, cards, flashcards. Um, because it offers free, free printable versions that you can print on um, flashcards and the alphabet and um, everything else. So um, it's, I'll be I'll be able to learn some Hebrew. But man, the, the amount of reading material I got to go through, like when when I first last year I started doing a lot of reading material, but I was doing it via Audible. Started with uh, the Crucified Life by A. W. Tozer, Danger of a Shallow Faith, Near Christianity, all those. Um, and uh, I still have some audiobooks to listen to. Um, and then I got some Ken, some of Ken Johnson's books, like uh, the, uh, hey, how you doing, Crazy God Story? Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, how are you? Pretty good. Uh, you missed my uh, uh, Torah um, study. Pretty much um, every week now, I'm going to be getting on um, uh, live fri Friday sundowns to welcome in the Shabbat and uh, doing these. Uh, Torah club studies that they uh, pretty much give a uh, really in-depth uh, study into uh, the life of Christ, and it's it's been it's been interesting and fulfilling and such a blessing. Uh, you'll be able to um, find it all on YouTube. Let me end my stream right now. <laughs> I don't need to be streaming anymore on YouTube. <laughs> um, 